Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're here today with Geraldine Fitzpatrick, and in this open session, we um, uh, we would like to hear from her her thoughts on some topics that have been on our minds, on the EC's minds uh, lately. Uh, but also we wanted to be open space for everyone to be able to chat as much as we can, I guess, in the hour that we have. Um, I could start with an introduction. It could be a really, really long one, and we might spend the hour doing that. So what I'm going to do instead is drop a link in a minute um, to your uh, Wikipedia page so that... Uh, do I even have like one? I don't even know <laughs> yes. what's... Do it. There you go. I don't, I don't, you I don't do, know what's do. on it though. Very interesting things, and and maybe we'll get we'll have time to get to it. Uh, but I'm between... looking it up. <laughs> so so Geraldine is really, I mean, true leader uh, in just okay. so many ways, and um, you know, long time volunteer with uh, Sikai. Uh, just received the Lifetime Award for Service, and we also heard from her uh, at Kai in a, in a conversation with Anna Cox, which was wonderful. Uh, so there's really just um, so many wonderful things uh, to, to say about Geraldine, but I'm, I'm just going to get us started with the goal of the open session, which was to talk about service, to talk about leadership, maybe to talk about what service leadership uh, means, because that's a term that we've been hearing more and more of uh, lately. And also, you know, many of us here, I think, have been on the Changing Academic Life podcast, which she's been doing, that has been such an immense service to the community. And I'm going to drop a link to that as well, uh, in case you haven't heard of it before. And here we have a chance to maybe reciprocate a little bit and to ask you some questions and learn from you. So um, let's let's just get started. And what I was thinking was I would maybe ask a few broad questions, hear um, your thoughts, and then open it up for people to pose their questions. I did say that if we have too much going on, too many thoughts that people have, maybe I'll do some filtering. I'll try not to though, uh, I think. There's, there's just so much uh, to unpack when we talk about volunteering, we talk about service, uh, how it's changing these days, these years with COVID, on account of COVID, maybe on account of other things. Uh, we've been talking much more on equity topics around volunteering. So just how do we recognize the labor of volunteers? You know, how do we recognize service? Um, so hopefully we'll get to touch on some of those things. But but starting out, Geraldine, um, could you maybe walk us through um, your volunteering journey, your service journey with um, with Sikai? And maybe you want to go pre Sikai. It, that's up to you. But just um, what kind of shaped your thoughts around service? Hmm. Um. I think I've always had an orientation to trying to contribute. If I think back to school days and, you know, starting up a, um, a student council there, because I thought students weren't getting enough say in the, in the governance of the school. And yeah, and it continued on in my various careers, sort of trying to do different things. And I think it, has been more about both seeing ways in which things could be improved or ways in which I think I could contribute and being part of trying to make that happen. And also the giving back, because I think in academia, the, the, whole, the whole system runs on free labour um, that you know, all of you are giving in your various service roles and or any publication that we get published. You know, if you just think about the army of people, maybe that's not a good term to use, but you know, like the whole numbers of people who have to be involved in organizing the conference in the background, who are more directly involved in handling your paper and the reviewers and then making decisions and the people who handle the publication process. I and mean, there's 
there's a cast of thousands and I I'm a big believer I think fairness is one of fairness and justice is one of my sort of core values and I think I see it almost as a fairness issue as well that if I'm benefiting I should also be looking at ways to contribute so that's played out over the years from um just being involved in organising different aspects of conferences. When I was in Australia, we had a local OzKai conference there and just a local community there that we did various things with or, um, yeah, volunteering. I mean, being a reviewer, uh, you know, co-chaired ECSCW 2003 with Paul um, Durish, you know, as my, I guess, first big role. Um, and other roles were more around, you know, like uh, Kai Papers Chair in 10 and 11, or was it 9 and 10, whatever the first, the second and third years were when we first started the subcommittees. And um, not just SIGCHI, but ACM more generally as well. So you know, I'm sort of, uh, I'm not directly involved in ACM Europe, but have been supportive of lots of initiatives and efforts there to get more European visibility in ACM. Um, uh, Co-editor of the uh, uh, Computing Enabled Me Careers column for the computers of uh, AC, the CACM magazine, because I think that's sort of a nice complement to the podcast series. Yeah, so like there, there are, and you know, they're the distinguished members committee. I just finished chairing the distinguished, the ACM distinguished members evaluation panel. So yeah, lots of different roles. I can't steering committees, um, things like that. So yeah, um, and before all of that, I think it says also on your Wikipedia page that you um, were a midwife. Is that correct? It is correct. And it's an obvious progression from midwife to computer science. <laughs> say some, say more about that. Um, it it was very pragmatic because I well actually in in midwifery we we had started up a, a private the first private midwifery practice in our state, uh, because we didn't think women were getting women centered care in in uh, in birthing in pregnancy care and birthing and uh it was a very political role and very very important as well i mean because this is touching women's lives and families lives at you know like the deepest point i mean something that they will always remember and uh, the privilege of being part of that uh, it was also quite exhausting because we were on call 24 hours a day this was pre smartphones and everything so you know you'd have the pager on um and at some point we came over to Europe to live because my husband's Irish and his fam his father was quite sick and we thought it was important to be closer to his side of you know that side of the world for a bit and then when we went back to Australia the thought of getting um locked back into the whole nursing system and the midwifery system and the hierarchies and the politics just felt a bit exhausting and people were starting to do their nursing degrees then but they weren't getting you anywhere in terms of different career paths and we were thinking that um, when we had kids I would still want to work part-time and nursing midwifery is a particularly family unfriendly career so uh, I had been doing a degree via the scenic route I'd had a couple of goes at starting uni um, I had been doing a degree via the scenic route. And so I went to the dean and said, oh, look, you know, I'm going to take it seriously. Instead of just saying, what can I do on a Tuesday night when I could go to uni? You know, how do I, how can I properly structure a degree? And they had this new informatics degree starting. So he did a good sales job and talked me into being part of the first cohort in the informatics degree at Queensland University. And it seemed like, you know, like I had no interest in computers really or programming, but it seemed like uh, an, something that would open up flexible working options in the future when we had kids. So that was the sole motivation for getting into computing. And as it happened, we weren't able to have any kids. So you know, what decision I would have made had I had a crystal ball? I don't know. Well, I do know, but 
you know, I've made the decision and here I am. Yeah. And as Catherine says, but we are lucky you did. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned <laughs> care, right? Uh, you, you mentioned care from just uh, being uh, a midwife. And, and I feel like uh, care is, is, is a thing that you do bring in, in abundance to our community. So thank you for that. Um, can you say a little bit about how that care shapes also the, the service that you do? Yes, I think I think what I've become clearer about over the time is where my strengths lie and where I can make the best contribution. And I think that, you know, if you if you might have heard me say, you know, like students didn't have a voice in the school, so starting the, the school council and you know, women didn't have a proper voice in the midwifery process, you know, in the birthing process, so starting a private midwifery practice so I've always had this people-centered perspective and I think that um, even when I'm doing something that's a very technical computer science degree and I did well in the degree because I'm conscientious um, I would always orient to aspects around people and taking and have always gone for taking more holistic views of contexts and embracing the messiness and that's played out in the research and I think just seeing what you know like accepting what sort of skills and strengths I can bring in the service I guess I play that out in a similar way um, so I would not be a good TPC for example and it's not that you don't you you need care in TPC role but I don't have the the I don't have the skills for the attention to detail and that more structured thinking that I think a TPC role needs. I don't think I'd be very good at it. I would definitely not be very good at any treasurer role <laughs> in any organization. Uh, um, so, you know, so I think it's, I think it's part of recognizing what you can contribute and that we can all contribute different things, which is really key. And we need each of our different skills and strengths and you know um, abilities to to pull it all together I think to your point about recognizing how you can contribute often people struggle to to identify those pathways right um, uh, do you have thoughts on how you would mentor people to to be identifying those pathways for themselves yeah. One of the things I think is really powerful to do, and it's we we don't give ourselves enough time to stop, take a breath, and just reflect. Um, we're so busy doing, doing, doing. And I think that just taking time to stop and really give yourself some focus time to reflect back on uh, when I feel like I've made a difference or been able to contribute what was I doing and just brainstorm out all of those different examples for yourself and then try to look across them and just say what am I what pattern am I seeing here because um I think Pejman in my discussion with with him for the podcast he said something about it's only when you look back that you see the threads or see how it all made sense or see how it all uh, worked out and I think it's similar here that I wouldn't have said from the beginning, oh, this is my this is my strength and this is, you know, I'm looking for a role that I can put that hat on. But as I see it playing out and I see roles where I didn't do so well as well, um, uh, I think you can start to reflect on that and unpack what was going on, who, you know, what who were you working with, what were you doing, um, what difference did you bring? And I think one of the really interesting things about this is these are often things that we take for granted because it's just who we are. And we don't think that we think everyone can handle, you know, if you're you're someone who can do spreadsheets or love spreadsheets, you just think everyone loves spreadsheets um, or everyone can do X. And that's not the case. But when we're particularly, when it's a particular strength, we often do take them for granted. So I think that we can do that for ourselves and I think we can do a lot for each other as well because we're often we often downplay our own contributions because I was just 
anyone can do that. That's easy, but it's not easy for everybody. Um, is to reflect back to one another. You know, hey, you know, um, Naya, I really like the way you did that. I love the blah 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 that you brought to it. And helping people reflect back and see their own strengths as well can help um, in fitting the fitting those teams together. And I think being aware of those can be really useful because when you're working in I'm just my microphone's just slipping. When you're working in team roles, which we often are within service within our community, you know, so you're a co-chair. I was a co-chair with Steve um, uh, Mental Brewster from Glasgow for Kai 19. Having the discussion early about what he's good at and what I'm good at as well helps some clarity in the beginning. Um, it helps for just sort of sharing up the jobs and roles. Um, so yeah, I think having that awareness is is useful. So yeah, doing your self reflection and helping each other become yeah, you know, telling each other what we see. So I guess one thing you're mentioning is self awareness. The other is possibly also humility and just room for um, for others to bring in strengths that you may not necessarily have. Um, another thing that I heard was, you know, we, we're often, I, I don't know about others on this call, I do feel that we're often hard on ourselves. And so we oh, might yeah. be, we might do, um, uh, do things that don't quite work out as we'd like for them to, and then, um, you know, maybe beat ourselves up about that not happening the way that it ought to have happened, instead of maybe thinking about it as a learning process, right? So yeah. uh, we're learning, and others are also learning. Um, uh, and I, I wonder how there could be a kinder process uh, to that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. do, you, do you have thoughts on just dealing with um, those kinds of, I, I don't want to call them failures, but just the, the process of self, of gaining self-awareness is yeah. a process of learning, yeah. right? So learning what we yeah. can do well, what we cannot do well. So yeah. how could we get there? Oh, that's just, that's such a good point now, because we can't be good at everything. And the first time you do a job, you're going to start off as a newbie because that's the nature of starting a new role or a new job. And so we do what we can to try to, you know, uh, jumpstart that, you know, so talking to other people who may have done the role before, looking for job des job descriptions if they exist, um, thinking about your own experience from other sides of that role and what you want to bring, but just bringing that learning mindset. And I think that especially as academics where we we – I don't know, I'm speaking for myself here, but also speaking for a lot of the people that I speak see, I think we do have very high expectations on ourselves and we don't, you know, we're often, we often get to these positions, we often get through PhD because we're perfectionists, because we have strong sort of ideals for ourselves and hold ourselves to high standards, um, and because the presentation of our successful self is so much a part of our academic identity as well. And so I think there's, you know, there's something just generally in the population about us not being very good about accepting that we can be learners and learning means learning and how we learn is by making mistakes and reflecting and learning. And just uh, then doubling down on that, that pressure on ourselves by, um, bringing out particular personality bents because we're in academia. So, yeah, I'd love us, I'd love us to be kinder on ourselves as individuals to not beat ourselves up when things don't go right, to say, um, I'm sorry. I, I just got called out at lunch today in a very gentle way by someone in the group because I got a bit cranky about, this isn't leadership, but I'd got a bit cranky about um, a student emailing a, a fellow lecturer at the weekend saying, you know, what do you mean by this assignment and answer me now? And I said, you know, what are they, do they think we're just waiting around for them? And this fellow lecturer, this fellow that you know, I was talking to at lunch, I'm just said, uh, 
We also have to remember that the students have really are going through really hard times still coming out of COVID and their experiences and, you know, have a lot going on. And I just, I could only go, PD, you're so right. Thank you for reminding me, you know, so, and I could have got defensive and said, but it was the tone of that email and, you know, they shouldn't expect it. And I don't, because I don't want people in my group working at the weekend. It's a strong cultural value that we try not to do that. Um, so I was operating out of that and concerned about the student, the, the lecturer, but yeah, Peter just reminded me about the student's perspective and it just would orient me to a different reaction or position on that. And so, I, you know, we just have to say, oops, yep, yeah, that was a bit harsh or I mucked up or that didn't work as well. And I think we just need to treat everything as an experiment in a way. And all of the changes that we're making, we're, you're, all of the people on the EC, the steering committee, um, conference organisation committees, everyone is a volunteer. Everyone is trying to do their best. And how do we also generously value and appreciate that and I don't know just tone down our judgment and just say um how fascinating when things go wrong there's a, someone I can't he's a he's a famous music conductor and he run I can't remember who he is there's a little clip on YouTube about him and he runs master classes with musicians like you know like I don't know cello players or whatever and uh, when they would make a mistake, you know, he would see them beating themselves up. And his whole attitude is, you know, well, that's how we learn. And, you know, you just go, how fascinating. You know, he's got this lovely British accent, you know, so how fascinating. So it's if we could just orient to the that was wrong you know, from instead of that, that was wrong. But to how fascinating that didn't work as well as we expected. There you go. Um, what can we learn from this for next time? and just allow ourselves and allow each other to be on a learning journey for any of these things, for the big changes that are being made in the, you know, the structure and governance of the, of the organisation to the little things that might happen in conference organisations. Um, no one's there trying to break it or to beat it up or to make things hard for you. And, and sometimes it is it is hard to remember that, right? Um, so uh, I guess you've mentioned this a few times, and I certainly recall this blog post from Kai 2019, which you shared, and um, this letter that you wrote to the Kai community. Uh, do you know which one I'm talking about? The, um, yes, but I can't remember exactly what I said. Yeah. So this is, I just shared uh, the... Yeah. Uh, and and it was it was sort of a reminder. It it starts with saying there is no Kai, there is you and me. We are Kai. Um, that that the event happens because of an enormous amount of volunteer effort and you know some thoughts on posting on social media and and basically about choosing kindness, right? Um, which was a really nice message and um, and. And and everything you you see and do is sort of a reminder of that, right? Um, very much so. Uh, what do you think might come in the way of um, choosing kindness? Um, I I got some pushback from that letter naturally because of the community that we are, but also in the in the good sense, like what Peter did for me today as well, just made me take a different perspective because again here I was really operating out of seeing people on our team really deeply hurt and upset who'd been killing themselves trying to do the right thing and there were other people who had different views and perspectives that I didn't really understand well so I think that uh, I had to work my way through to having more kindness to those reactions as well and understand where they were coming from and separating out perhaps the way they were expressed from actually the truth of what people were expressing and recognizing that all of these things are taking place within structures in academia that are conducive that create the pressures that lead to this you know so I don't know someone's paper getting rejected or whatever 
may have serious implications for someone's next um, career job or uh, promotion valuation. And, and there may be such pressures in their institution to have this paper accepted. And I think it's also understanding the structural issues underpinning a lot of these challenges that people are facing that that make it harder to take an other perspective and sometimes as I said it's sort of not always realizing who are the diversity of others of you know, perspectives that we could be taking so yeah I don't know how we could how we could bring in kindness more um yeah, and that's the safe saying about the cultural issues, you know, where some people just don't complain. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Would you like to share your thoughts on that, on the on this question from Saif? So I just want to read it out just because this is going to be a recording uh, at some point, right? So Saif is asking... Some cultures have very ingrained not to complain. And as a consequence, certain harms are never surfaced. What is a good way to balance this where we show kindness, but also talk about harms that are hard to talk about? And she says, thank you for the very inspiring conversation. I don't know, Steph, do you have any suggestions here? Because I don't know how, I sort of, mm, like I'm thinking about some of the reaction that I got for that letter I didn't know that there was stuff I didn't know to in order to help facilitate um the the surfacing of those issues if you know what I mean so how do we how do we know what we don't know how do we find out what we don't know mm -hmm. and uh, I guess how how do we create safe spaces for those conversations to even happen yeah. where it's okay to yeah. um yeah yeah uh, maybe it's a culture of yeah maybe and again I don't know that you know like the cultural issues may still override but you know what what does it take to create a safe space because we can say those words but what does it take to create a safe space within our context I I I think I have a good idea both from the literature and from you know, day to day practice about how I might try to do that. I don't always succeed. Um, you know, within our group, for example. Um, but again, I had a meeting with someone today who's been dealing with issues, who hasn't said anything up to now. And I mean, luckily today they did, and we were able to explore different ways forward. But yeah, I don't know how to do this within a big international community where we don't have the basis of the relationship building in the same way. Because um, I can't imagine someone coming to a, a forum like this, especially from a culture where it's ingrained not to complain, to, to bring something up. And maybe, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud and I'd be interested to hear other people's thoughts about, you know, is it just being more conscious of, checking in with people and just asking how they're going or how they experience that or yeah you know, what do they think I mean where we do have contacts um, and showing a willingness to listen and I think one of the things that I'm always trying to learn is not to be defensive as my first reaction which is you know I, I, for me it's often a natural sort of first reaction you know, you know, hands, like the figurative hands on the hip and um you know uh, protecting and justifying and sometimes like today I think I was quick at going yeah you're right but then there are other days where it might take me a, you know, a couple of days later to come back and go oh yep yeah, sorry you were right let I, you know let's talk about it a bit more so yeah how do we how do we do that to sh you know, like show that real willingness to listen and understand different perspectives yeah, Susan says, um, takes courage both to acknowledge and how to react to such challenges and honesty, uh, as well as a willingness to listen. So what you yeah. just said. Uh, Michael says, I'm sorry to complicate things, but if we want to create a safe space, then who will experience it as safe and on which topics? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're learning. 
I, and I think we're learning, you know, if I think of a lot of the changes that have been made over the years, there's a lot more sensitivity to issues and attempts to create spaces, even if we're not sure about who they're safe for or whether they're really successful or not, than compared to 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, so I can see that we're learning and and I guess it's experimenting. I mean, in that learning mindset, experimenting with different models and see what works for whom, because I, I'm imagining that the same sort of safe space won't work for everybody. And as, you, as Michael's implying there, what's safe for one person may not be safe for another at all. Um, yeah. So, yeah, um, thank you for that. Plus one, Susan says, and me as well. Uh, Navina says, I've also heard of the concept of brave spaces, which encourages not just safety, but the complexities and struggles of creating safety. And I think that's one of the misconceptions around the language of safe spaces and kindness, because it implies that we always have to be nice and don't bring up anything hard, don't deal with hard issues. and you know, Brene Brown, who's, you know, very popular science sort of a social work researcher, author, whatever, talks about, um, you know, like having that, having, being on it's like, oh, what's her mantra around this? I, I've just gone blank on it. Um, being clear is kind, like kind, having a safe space doesn't mean you can't have conversations that are hard or dealing with difficult issues. Now, it is about the brave conversations, but they're done in a in a in the context where you feel like you're not being attacked personally or judged. It's the issue you're discussing, that there's mutual respect and listening, and that you all in the end somehow want the best, even if your best may not be aligning. I mean, part of the discussion is trying to work that out, but yeah, so safe and kind doesn't mean namby-pamby and avoiding the hard stuff at all. In fact, that's not safe. That's the opposite. You know, um, and Susan says vulnerability. Uh, Kale uh, had his hand up. Um, I don't know, Kale, if you would like to. Sure, yeah. Just to, just to actually add on what you're saying, Geraldine. Um, yeah, if we take it, to be the case that a lot of the norms that we have that keep that sort of super feel of peace are very violent and oppressive, then yeah, avoiding and invalidating those moments of anger and outrage are, you know, violence in themselves. And that eruption is important to acknowledge and hold. Like I know in a lot of my personal interactions, the way that sort of huge traumas can be dealt with is just by sort of shouldering some of that pain and trauma and upset and sort of just like offloading it into the circles and circles and circles of privilege that have that space to do that. And so creating those spaces, as you're saying, is for, you know, <laughs> support and care and bravery, uh, as Naveena put out there. Um, yeah. yeah, that's key. So, you know, also building up those small cultural communities uh where they're at within those mm. cultural norms and allowing that to expand outwards so the cultural empowerment part is really important yeah. as well i think yeah i yeah i agree and I, I think it's also important to build the trust build the bases one little drip at a time like we don't it, it doesn't work if we're normally closed and unresponsive or whatever and then we say we're having an open meeting you know uh, once a month so I think there's it's the little we, mm, I don't know how does not to underestimate the power of the little things that build up to create the trust and the the sense that it's okay in order to bring in the big things um, you know we don't have to do the big grand gestures all the time I think the little the little things, the little seeing people, the little just checking in on people or the, the sending the message of you know, your contributions are important, I think. It'd be interesting to do a survey of the community now that the EC meetings are open, whether people feel like there's more of um, 
a willingness to hear different perspectives, even if they don't attend any of those meetings or contribute anything, you know, like just the, 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 the little messaging, repeated messaging and the culture at every touch point, I think we have to look at how we can imbue them with a sense of care. That's a really interesting thing you bring up, Geraldine, because what you're also pointing to is how not necessarily the things people are doing that are um, visible, but also the invisible shifts that we would hope to bring about, shifts that um, may be taking place, maybe not, but we'll never know because we don't actually have any insight on the, the missing data, so to speak. Um, uh, okay, so Michael brought up that in the critical and sustainable computing AC reviews, they've been working hard to provide constructive and respectful criticism when criticism is needed. Kind criticism is actionable to achieve good for multiple persons. I think this is also something that has come up in the past in one of our open sessions about critique being love. Mm -hmm. and, uh, how do we offer that love? Um, uh, and and it's it, it's it's a, a nice thought, but people may be hurt and there might be upsets, and and those also need to be kind of um, understood. There's also um, this part I think that's really important for us to touch on here about burnout right, about um, volunteering burnout. We've been hearing a lot of that. I think we see some of it um, very closely. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen that in your uh, circles as well and just more publicly as well. Do you have um, thoughts on that? How do we deal so, with it? Sorry, I was just distracted by it. Say, say that again, Neha, I was just distracted. Yeah, um, well, Michael did do, do follow up. So Michael said, thank you, should have said that. Critique as care, critique as love. Um, oh, burnout. And yes, coming back. So so burnout is what I, I um, uh, brought up. That, that That's something that we've heard from a lot of people yeah. in the community. Yeah. We've seen it also with with a lot of people who are close to us. And um, how do we deal with that? Mm. I, I think we need to share the load, definitely. And I, you know, there's some people who always get asked to do things because everyone knows that they'll say yes and they'll do a good job. And there are other people who occasionally get asked to do something, do a bad job, and then no like no one ever asks them again and I sort of get a bit uh I, you know, I get a bit cranky with that um because it is there is as we said in the beginning there is a huge amount of volunteer effort that goes into sustaining and and growing and developing you know, the community not just in the conferences but you know as community and yeah I don't know how to do that I think we need to give people permission to say they're burnt out and to say they can't do everything. Um, and often if we are the sort of conscientious person, then when we do take on a job, we do fear, well, I, again, I'm probably talking about myself, um, but I, perhaps I'm sure many people would could relate, but I feel like if I've said yes to something, I have to do it to see it through. And then if I let people down and I, you know, I worry about all those sort of things. And there are times when I just have to recognize that um, I, I might just have to let people down because that care also has to come back to ourselves. Because if we're depleted, we've got nothing to give. We've got nothing, nowhere to care from. Um, so I think for a, a longer term sustainable view, we we definitely need to acknowledge our limits. I, I know that there are some people, um, you know, like Anna Cox is very good at you know, really exploring this, who, who really try to set limits on what service they do, like realistically look at, uh, you know, like I think Anna's got a blog that's got a, a spreadsheet or thing where, you know, if I saying that they can do x number of reviews or x number of external thesis exams and y numbers of you know, other roles and then 
having that sort of predefined benchmark to say, thanks for the invitation, glad you thought of me, and I don't have capacity to take on any more this year. So I think that sometimes that can be really important that we set our own limits and recognising. So the, this is the other thing. Sometimes we think, oh, they've asked me to do it and I have to do it or I, I'll be letting Neha down if I don't say yes. Whereas sometimes Neha just wants someone to do the job. You know, like it doesn't matter. And Well, you've asked me because you think I'd be good at it, but you don't necessarily need me specifically. It's um, you just need a quick answer from me so you know whether that job's going to get done. And then there might be other times when you do want just me to do something. So I think we we have to check in with the other person, like just check our own assumptions. And we might go back to the other person and say, uh, how important is it for you that I do this, you know, or is it that anybody could do it? And then there, there are lots of ways of saying no then, or perhaps thinking about other people who may benefit from this opportunity, who may not be as visible in, in someone's network. Um, and also recognizing that other people can do a good job as well, even though it might be a job you want to do. And I think the hardest things to say no to aren't the jobs that you want to do, but the jobs you do want to do. Um, they're the harder things to say no to, and they they, they can often be the, the the straws on the camel's back that break it because we've said yes to something we we shouldn't have. And sometimes it's renegotiating a role. I. I can't do the whole thing, but I could contribute this much. Does that help? Would that be helpful in any way? Um, so I think that, yeah, we we do have to really look, take responsibility to look out for ourselves and look out for one another. Um, just reminding, again, that that sort of, you know, just reflecting back to one another and we try to do that in our group a little bit at work, just sense checking that, you know, you've been asked to do something, you want to do it, but I'm not feeling right. What, you know, help me think through it and helping people just say there'll always be another conference or there'll always be another opportunity to do something or whatever. So I think we can do that. And I know it's not very scientific, but I think listening to your gut is also important. Um, Absolutely. And I can tell that I can just tell a very short story about it. agreeing to do a book chapter for uh, someone who, where they their research institute was celebrating 25 years. Um, they were having a book chapter on each of their themes. One of them was on health, health and aging related stuff. They asked me to do a, a book chapter that sort of introduced their work and, and set it in context. And, you know, I have a big commitment to especially supporting women academics and I particularly wanted to support this person and it's an area that I, you know, have done a lot of work in and like as well and I said yes. But um, I ended up having some sleepless nights stressing about how I was going to fit that in and, uh, you know, and so I'd also built it up in my mind. So I ended up just having to say going back to them and say I know it's late notice and this is going to leave you in the lurch but I just can't do it I, I would have really just cracked up if I had of and in the end we we you know just in the course of some discussions I don't know somehow I built it up into this you know, I have to write this 30 page book chapter and I have to do a full systematic review of all of the literature in this field and I ended up you know doing a six page or basically built from some notes I'd already done that was good enough and so I don't know just watching our own perfectionist expectations as well that might push us into burnout and so it ended up just being a day's work that I could fit in and I did it and it's good enough and I think we need to embrace good enough more you know because that's good and it's enough it may not be perfect you know and sometimes um someone else can do good enough and if it's not you so yeah but burn, oh. yeah burnout is a big issue and again there are structural issues that are contributing to that and i don't want to see our communities contributing to that by becoming overcomplicated like sometimes some of the suggestions that come out of 
from people about oh we should do this or we should do this or you know you should do this and it would take so much extra volunteer work to do you know we could do it but does anyone really have the time and is it worth doing it and I think they're questions we need to ask what's good enough as a community in our conferences in our whatever in our processes yeah, and Susan says good enough is often good enough. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Geraldine. That was really insightful. There, there are also comments from Zeneb uh, from Kiel. Um, so Zeneb talks about how the little actions mean so much to some and figuring out how to do this while considering the size of the communities is interesting. Starting small, but then reaching and bringing in closer, those are far for meaningful growth. And I think this this idea of the community's largeness, right, is also a factor. I mean, yeah. you talked about sharing the load, you talked about kind of uh, looking out for each other. And I think that's also easier to do when uh, you feel that sense of community. But if you're not feeling that sense of community, it's really hard to look out for, for each other. Um, so I wonder if, if that's something that, um, you know, you have thoughts on. Uh, second thing I'll quickly mention is about just saying no. So saying no to tasks. It seems like from the things that you were mentioning, it really um, stood out that often there's incomplete information, right, about the task at hand. So either you have incomplete information about what's being asked of you or why you're being asked. Maybe someone else could be asked or um, what is really the need that you are addressing? Is it just this review? Is it, uh, you know, where is the, what is the source of the anxiety and how could you address the anxiety that leads to that request as opposed to the request itself, which you might service in some way. Yeah. Uh, people have talked about having a no committee. So having someone yeah. who will kind of teach you how to say no, but as you said, it's really hard to, to go to your no committee when you have to ask that you want to say yes to. Um, so maybe it would be helpful to put together like a set of tactics just in terms of, you know, how, how do we try to get at more complete information that could allow us to yeah. avoid burnout? I don't know if you have thoughts on that. I think for those, I, I think if you're being asked, asking, I don't know, like what does done look like? for you you know what are you expecting what does done look like because if I had have had that conversation with this person about the book chapter um done would have looked like I'm sure they would have said I don't know six to eight pages you know and instead of the 30 whatever that I'd built up in my head um so I think you know I could have checked in and I think also when we make requests of people we could be clearer about what it is we're needing or what's negotiable and what's non-negotiable in terms of scope and scale. Um, uh, like you couldn't have someone be general chair of a conference for the two months. I can only do the two months leading up to the conference. Like that that wouldn't work. So there's, you know, there are things where I think just being clear in the asking and not feeling pressure to jump to say yes, I think is important so that you can also think about, you know, connecting back to the strengths thing. What, how can you negotiate the role to best, if you do decide you do want to do it, also how do you negotiate the role so that you can best shape it to deliver maximum value for what you can bring? Um, and I, uh, the recent podcast I put out with Julie Keynes, I thought was lovely in this regard where, she was being asked to take on a head of department role, which is a really big role. And different, if we think about our own heads of department, different heads of departments play it out in very different ways. Some are really great at, I don't know, the strategic thinking. Others might be really good at the people management, but not so good at the strategy or the upward management or the downward management and so on. And one way that she reconciled it for herself that she could do this um, was she connected to what she saw as her red thread that connected to things that she loved doing, which was around mentoring. And when she could reshape in her head or reconceptualize in her head, the head of department role as um, 
actually, it's really just mentoring all the people in the faculty, you know, so it's just a different way of mentoring. And when she could shape it like that, that connected to what she was good at and what she loved doing, it sounds like she, you know, when she goes on to talk, it sounds like she did an absolutely amazing job connecting to that. And maybe, I don't know, I'm just so you know, maybe someone in that position, other people might say, oh, they didn't do so well at the strategy or they didn't do so well at the budget. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think it's seeing how you can shape roles as well when you do want to say yes, so that you can maximise the value that you bring because it does connect to what you're good at and what you love doing. And it'll be more fun as well. Yeah, um, Gail says, well, a long message here, but basically there are systemic reasons beyond self-care that burnout is, is such a big conversation. Um, totally. So I'm not sure if yeah. I read that out. Yeah. Uh, and that's correctly. the structural issues that I was talking about before. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, there's just an article that came out recently um, that just talked about yeah, you know, Bennett. That doesn't mean we can't do stuff to look out out for ourselves because we're the ones in the middle, in the middle of that boiling, you know, pot of water. Um, and we need to work out how to stop the pot boiling and bring it back to some nice tepid temperature. You know, so that that's the bigger structural changes that are slower. So I I think that we we definitely need to work at both levels. Like the solution is not self-care, end of story. The solution is self-care for now, just so I can get out of bed tomorrow or just so that I can keep going or so that I'm sustainable. But if I if we don't address the structural issues, and I think it's really encouraging um, to see some of the bigger international initiatives that are reviewing research evaluation to try to shift us away from being so driven by quantitative metrics. And I'm talking about things like the San Francisco Agreement, DORA, the EU's just put out a, is it a position paper or white paper or something that um, reflects very similar values to DORA. And it's about you know, trying to encourage people when they evaluate people for promotions or you know, positions that we don't focus on quantity, but we focus on quality. And you know, so there's a shift to more narrative reviews, for example, that allows you to make the arguments, narrative arguments, rather than the bullet point list of, you know, look, I have these so many best paper awards um, about what your contribution is and why it's important and the problem that you're solving. Um, another podcast I did was with some people from Glasgow University from their research culture unit where they've now built in collegiality into their evaluation system for promotion um, and their annual review as an equal criteria for research and teaching and, and service. And I know that with all of these things, and you know, like the, the Netherlands National Research Council have done this as well. You know, and I know that it is problematically being worked out in its practical details. I know that reviewers are often struggling to make sense of narrative reviews and how to do that. Um, institutions may sign up to some of these agreements, but it doesn't percolate down to the eight people sitting around the table making the decision about who we hire in this committee uh, for this position. Um, but it's encouraging for me that we're on the learning journey to work those things out and we're on a trajectory away from quantitative measures. And that may stop some of the um, salami slicing of our research and chasing, you know, expecting people to have six Kai publications before they start a PhD. I, I, no, we don't quite. But I know that in the US, I've heard many stories about people actually needing publications even before they start a PhD. Whereas when I did a PhD, um, you know, if you came out with one or two publications in total, that was great. Um, so, you know, maybe we can take the pressure off everyone as well that may reduce some of these structural pressures and that institutional pressures that are leading to the burnout, that are leading to people not um, volunteering for service, because if I do service, I don't get to write my 10th paper this year. Um, you know, so I think if we can 
yeah, I think it might take a while because we know that institutions are slow to change. Um, but I, it's def they're definitely going in encouraging directions, which is great to see. Thank you, Geraldine. Some comments from Michael and Susan in the chat. Um, you know, uh, for this call, we had set the time so that many people from the future Sikai committee could also attend. And I thought it was so important just because these are our early career members who are starting out and were getting involved in Sikai related projects. And so for them to be able to hear from you uh, also. And, you know, it's a group of mentors and mentees and we're trying to just sort of, um, uh, uh, trying to create space to think out of the box. Maybe this is one of the things that we need some out of the box uh, thoughts or approaches on. Um, I had also wanted to ask, but I don't think we have time for that, just how mentorship works, right? We, we've talked about looking out for each other. It seems to me to be the case that there's more mentorship that happens when you're earlier in your career than later. It becomes harder and harder to find um, people who are in positions or have the capacity to mentor. And, uh, you know, maybe that's a question for another day. But if, if, if you do have any thoughts on that, uh, that you want to share, please go yeah. ahead. I, th I think mentorship is a is an umbrella term for a whole uh, bag of different sorts of relationships and models. And mm -hmm. a lot of it is thinking about what's going to work well for what I need now. Sometimes they're very time limited. I need mentoring for how to organize this next event that's happening in a time restricted date. Um, or sometimes it can be uh, I'm dealing with burnout. You know, how do you, how do you deal with burnout? And it's sort of a more open-ended, longer-term thing, less sort of focused. Um, and they need all different strategies. So I think it's some of again in that being clear when people ask questions. I think we could be clearer. I'm trying to learn to be clearer in mentoring relationships about what we get out of it. Sometimes I think the more structured mentoring relationships that are set up by institutions don't work as well as more um emergent ones but yeah we just need to be clear about what we want from people and we often need a board of mentors we need different mentors for different sorts of things there may be people we just connect to every now and then there may be people that we say can you you know can we meet every month for the next six months or or whatever it is so mm -hmm. I think I think the first thing is unpacking what does mentoring mean within this context? What do people need and what can people offer and how to, how to fit that? Absolutely. And there's, there's a point that comes up often. So we had an open session on mentoring. I think it was almost a year ago now. And Michael was there and we talked about co-mentoring and, you know, quote unquote, reverse mentoring, but just sort of thinking about different different models and it doesn't have to be one-on-one. -on -one. It mm. doesn't have to be older person to younger person. Yeah. It's There's just totally. a whole of ways to really think yeah. about yeah. mentoring. Yeah. And I, not to, yeah, I think we, we also get stuck on the one-on-one -on -one model. And I think sometimes having uh, yeah, different sort of group models, peer models, peer mentorship, um, or a, a senior person with a group of people. I mean, they, and where people also you know, mentor each other. So there are lots of different models and that's, yeah, that's part of, I think, unpacking. So I'm currently working with some people in um, at Greece, you know, they're, they're a, a European country on, they're trying to set up a mentorship model and, you know, they're constrained by people who are, you know, in the burnout, you know, like don't have a lot of time, but want to support younger people. And what's a model of mentorship that fits their context, their resources, and also meets the needs of the people who need mentoring. So, yeah, I think being realistic about expectations and what people can give. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a lot more uh, where all of that came from. I, I bet uh, I want to say thank you all uh, for listening. Thank you, Geraldine, for that mentoring that you did just now, which wasn't one-on-one. -on -one, so clearly it is possible, uh, right? And um, 
it it would be great to continue this conversation another time another place but uh thank you all uh for attending and